Street Fighter 2, easily the most iconic fighting game ever made. This classic title may very well be the video game that rejuvenated the arcade industry and set the blueprint for all fighting games to come. But rather interestingly, this is not the sequel that the gentleman who created the original game would work on, as they would create a different spiritual sequel that has become iconic in its own right. So with all of that said, join me today as we look at the vintage fighting game that the creators of Street Fighter would envision as the true sequel to their 1987 game of importance. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. This is the story of Fatal Fury King of Fighters, the real Street Fighter 2, yeah. The Capcom and SNK crossover games are epic, but before these collaborations, the history of the two companies being intertwined went beyond the fact that they were just competitors. An obvious starting point for today's tale of course brings us to 1987 and the release of the original Street Fighter arcade game. While this game is straightforward and rudimentary by today's standards, it would function as the first in the series that would go on to form an entire dynasty. A million miles from its distant successor Street Fighter VI, this simplistic fighting game began to lay some of the early groundwork for the fighting game genre. Street Fighter I was directed under the leadership of Takeshi Nishiyama and was designed by Hiroshi Matsumoto, two geniuses who could be considered two of the most important Capcom employees from the period. In this maiden voyage for the first time ever, players played as the martial artist Ryu as he competed in the first World Warrior tournament spread across different countries facing off against 10 opponents. Rather than being able to control every character in the game, player 1 could control Ryu and player 2 could play as debuting Ken. In these pre-Street Fighter 2 days, some of the tropes of fighting games were formed within this title, with players being able to perform three punches and kick attacks that varied in strength and speed, along with special moves including the famous Hadouken and Shryuken, which were performed with certain button combinations. Matsumoto has stated in the past that the Hadouken move that he came up with was inspired by an energy missile attack from the 1970s anime series Space Battleship Yamoto. Although very dated now, the game was a smash hit at the time and as a result would be ported to a variety of different formats so that consumers could take the game home. Capcom made great money from the title and critics loved it. So of course, like with any game that makes a lot of money, Capcom would begin quickly iron up making a sequel. From here, the obvious choice you would expect Capcom to make would simply be to reuse the same team members and have them work on Street Fighter 2, but this simply wasn't possible. You see, what may come as a surprise to some is that Nishiyama would leave the company shortly after the release of the game, meaning that a different man would need to take the helm when it came to the development of any licensed sequel. In 1989, Capcom tried their luck with the Street Fighter brand when they attached the name Street Fighter 89 to one of their arcade cabinets that they were test marketing at trade shows. The response to this was negative as the high quality side scrolling beat em up in question related little to the original Street Fighter game. So Capcom would go with the name Final Fight instead, leaving the Street Fighter brand intact and ready to use another time. As we know, such a day would finally come in 1991 with the release of the groundbreaking, immensely good Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, a game that you will certainly know enough about that we can stop there as its impact is undeniable. But this is of course where today's tale gets really interesting and diverges somewhat. You see, the very same year Street Fighter 2 released, another fighting game hit the market, one of which could easily be argued as the true successor to the first Street Fighter game. As the title of this video suggests, I am of course alluding to SNK's Fatal Fury King of Fighters, a fighting game that would be directed by none other than Street Fighter creator Takashi Nishiyama himself. Taking this important fact into account, a strong case could be made that the true sequel to the beloved 1987 Street Fighter was finally here. Apart from this existing as the game that Nishiyama envisioned as the sequel to Street Fighter, this title is also notable for a number of other reasons too, so let's break down exactly what this one would bring to the table and why it is so significant. This head-to-head -head fighting game, like Street Fighter before it, would spawn many legendary sequels and spin-offs. In fact, not only would there be multiple Fatal Fury games over the years, but many of the characters would be included in the franchise's even more successful relative, King of Fighters, allowing for characters like Terry Bogard to become intrinsic parts of SNK's identity. 
The game that would inspire so many other SNK titles would be the first entry from a long line of great fighting games that would continually challenge Capcom as the number one developer and publisher of 2D sprite based fighting games in Japan. So for this reason, the development of Fatal Fury is an incredibly significant chapter in fighting game history. As for what can be experienced when playing this one, Fatal Fury's gameplay includes many of the tropes you would think of when it comes to games of this kind today. Simple ideas that would be considered formulaic by now. These simplicities include best of 2 out of 3 falls matches and being able to control your fighter using the directional joystick paired with 3 attack buttons. These 3 buttons in Fatal Fury's case are used for punching, kicking and throwing. Alongside these basic manoeuvres, players can also execute special techniques by inputting specific button combinations. To help assist the player in achieving this, Fatal Fury took the novel approach of showing the player the input methods over the course of the game, or more specifically, after bonus rounds, which we shall touch more on soon. Personally, I like this approach to the gameplay, as I see no reason why a passerby in an arcade at this stage would have possibly known how to execute such moves. This was only 1991 after all. Thinking about it, in these early days, many fighting game cabinets would feature control methods as part of the unit's artwork. But I guess this was not an option when it came to Fatal Fury, as the title would run on a Neo Geo MVS arcade unit. You know, the uniform arcade cabinets that had interchangeable cartridge slots allowing arcade vendors to cost effectively swap games without the need of an entirely new cabinet every time they wanted to allow visitors to play something else. Such technology would prove extremely useful in Fatal Fury and other SNK games being distributed around Japan far and wide. While there are lots of similarities between Fatal Fury and modern fighting games, it does feature some quirky mechanics that you do not tend to see nowadays. Completely different from the majority of fighting games, Fatal Fury would feature what is known as two-lane battles. This meant that many stages in the game would feature two-row combat, consisting of a background row and a foreground row. This would mean at times players had the ability to change between these two rows, delivering an experience that would separate it from other fighting games it was competing with. As mentioned previously, this game was envisioned as the sequel to the 1987 Street Fighter game, so as you can see there are many mechanical differences to that of which fighting games would become more synonymous with after the mass market success of Street Fighter 2. Aside from the two lane system which makes the game tremendously different from more modern fighters, the two player aspect of the game also differs greatly from newer fighting games too. To put it simply, in Fatal Fury, if a second player joins in, fights are not postponed in the battle to allow for a one-on-one -on -one match between the two players, but instead, two players get to team up against the CPU opponent, essentially allowing for two-on-one -on -one handicap matches rather than instantly challenging one another. Like many other fighters aside from a single player arcade mode to best, as mentioned briefly earlier, the game has its own bonus rounds. These bonus stages occur after every two matches, and are basically mini-games that involve elements such as arm wrestling against the machine, which involves tapping a button repeatedly. Not particularly exciting, but it's worth a mention. As relevant as all of these intricacies are in making Fatal Fury Fatal Fury, it is not necessarily the gameplay itself that would define this game, but rather the franchise's characters and story. Again, as expected, there are some similarities with other fighters. Much like with the 1987 Street Fighter title, the plot of Fatal Fury revolves around the simple premise of a martial arts tournament. In this game's case, the event is known as the King of Fighters tournament, and is held in a fictional American city known as Southtown. However, to give this now classic story a little more depth, the tournament is sponsored by a somewhat weeby crime boss known as Geese Howard. But to understand the motives of this fantastic villain and final boss, we need to look at the events that occurred years before the tournament took place. Ten years prior to the events of the game, Geese murdered his martial arts rival Jeff Bogard to ensure that he remained the world's number one fighter. This formed the backdrop for the tale that is told in Fatal Fury, including providing us with sensible motivations as to why each of the game's small lineup of playable characters are choosing to fight in this one. Also, when I say a few fighters, I really mean that, as following in Street Fighter 87's footsteps, there is little in the way of choice. Street Fighter are two playable characters who came in the form of Ryu and Ken, and its spiritual successor expanded choices to three playable characters. These include Jeff Bogard's adopted sons, Andy and Terry Bogard, along with their longtime friend Joe Higashi. 
all three men entered the tournament in the hopes of getting their revenge against the dastardly Geese Howard, offering up a very simple to digest plot. In terms of the three playable fighters, Terry Bogard, who has become somewhat of a mascot for SNK, is an American martial artist. His younger brother, Andy Bogard, specializes in a mix of karate and ninjutsu, which he learned in Japan, and Joe Higashi is a Japanese Muay Thai expert. One assumes, just like with Ken and Ryu before them, Nishiyana opted for playable fighters who he saw as appealing to both Japanese and Western consumers alike. Within this game, before reaching the villain league East Howard, players must defeat seven other AI-controlled opponents. These include Duck King, a street dancer with a rhythmical fighting technique, a Capoeira master known as Richard Mayer, Michael Max, a boxer with a projectile attack, Raiden, a heel wrestler who uses four infamous Japanese poison mist techniques, Waje, a Muay Thai master who uses enhancement drugs to give him special techniques, Tung Fu Ru, a fighting expert masquerading as a meekly old man, and of course, Billy Kane, a Dave Perry cosplayer who is a bikini babe loving undefeated champion who struggles with the ice stage on Mario 64. Comment below if you understand that obscure reference. Once a player has fought their way through this colourful lineup of enemies, only then did they earn the opportunity to face off against Geese Howard. The lunatic final boss of the game who has an Aikido fighting style and the ability to use an attack similar to Terry's Power Wave. To Geese Howard, all of his opponents are predictable. As you can now probably see from all of this, Fatal Fury King of Fighters is a decent little game that helped pioneer the way forward for many SNK games that will come. What is particularly interesting is that there are probably more similarities between Fatal Fury and Street Fighter 87 than there are the latter in Street Fighter 2, making it all the clearer that this game is the follow up from the same creator. As strong a legacy as Fatal Fury now has in its own right, no one can deny that this game in 1991 was greatly overshadowed by Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior. A case could be made that rather than building on the first Street Fighter game, Street Fighter 2 varied so greatly that it would morph into its own beast. Functioning as such an impressive game with such a wide player base that most people who discovered it had never even seen nor played the first Street Fighter game. Of course with Street Fighter 2 and Fatal Fury coming out the same year, with their shared history, the majority of journalists from the period would choose to compare the two games directly. In fact, let's be fair, to this day it is still an obvious comparison to make, with Maximum for example retrospectively commenting that the game failed to offer any real competition for Street Fighter 2 in either playability or character selection, concluding the only main point in this game's favour is that two of the characters may team together to take on a computer opponent in a three player frenzy and the game also tries to offer something else new with a two tier playing arena but the slow action and the disgracefully difficult fireball motions make special moves something of a rare occurrence. Still, despite all of this, it is a rather unfair comparison when you consider that Street Fighter 2 would go on to change the entire fighting game genre, a luxury at the time of its development that Nishiyama had no opportunity to build on in the same ways that many fighting game developers would down the line post the first Fatal Fury game. Aside from all of this though, reviews for the game at the time were pretty strong, which would mean aside from the MVS release and the obviously expensive yet perfect home version of the game on the Neo Geo AES, the game would also receive ports to a number of home platforms, each of which would see varying levels of success and quality in execution. Obviously no version would be as good as those on Neo Geo hardware, especially considering that the AES could probably deliver the best home console experience on planet Earth at the time but developers would try their best with other hardware. The first of these ports would appear on the Super Nintendo in 1992. This version of the game was developed by Nova and published by Takara. Interestingly, this version of the game completely dropped the two-lane system in favour of a much more conventional single-plane one, which, in my opinion, was a decision that was clearly made in an attempt to make the game appear more like Street Fighter 2. To make it even more Street Fighter-y, two-on-one bouts were also removed, and the bonus round featuring arm wrestling was taken out of the game in favour of a stage where the player punches flying tyres. This looks somewhat reminiscent of the barrel bonus stage found in Street Fighter 2. The final huge and welcome change was that in the game's versus mode, players now had the ability to control all of the previously uncontrollable CPU fighters, altering the game so drastically that by this point it could be argued that the game had just become a Street Fighter 2 clone. 
It's ironic when you think about it that Fatal Fury was designed as a spiritual successor to Street Fighter, with it being directed by Nishiyama himself to only later be altered to play more like Capcom's published sequel. It's poetic in a strange way. Over the course of the next year, in 1993, the game would make its way over to the Sega Mega Drive. Being published directly by Sega themselves, this version of the game shares lots of similarities with the SNES version. But some of the characters, including Dave Perry lookalike Billy Kane, would be moved from the lineup of CPU opponents in the single player mode and be replaced with whichever of the two main characters the player does not select. An equally decent version of the game produced by Magical Company would also see release on the Sharp X68000 Japanese computer, which about rounds up the different conversions of the title that could be found in the early 90s. Street Fighter 2 may be one of the most important fighting games ever made, but that doesn't mean that the other successor to the 1987 game, Fatal Fury, doesn't have an important history in its own right. Anyway, if you enjoyed this one, subscribe and check out my recent upload on SVC Chaos. Cheerio! Thank you